We're going to get started. Members, we're going to start. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to welcome the student representatives who are with us, Marta Dean and Mason Schlieff. Um, we will, there, it notes that there's the potential for a break at the call of the chair, uh, but I plan on plowing through so that we can hit the snow and plow through that uh, afterwards. <laughs> Some of y'all caught that, thanks. Uh, <laughs> so we will start with uh, somewhat of a continued conversation, but specific to the Rochester campus, uh, focused around uh, system-wide enrollment planning. This is the fourth uh, of our system-wide campus-specific conversation. It'll culminate in five-year enrollment plans that the administration will bring forward for our review at the March meeting. I want to note before we begin that this one will be different than our previous conversations due to the unique nature of the Rochester campus, its size, and its relative newness. We're going to hear more about the campus planning for the future and not just enrollment during the presentation. And while the presenters come on up, I will first turn to the president uh, for opening remarks. Thank you, Chair Omari. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, I am delighted to tee up this conversation about strategic enrollment and planning for the University of Minnesota Rochester. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our intent today is to discuss the results of a comprehensive long-range planning endeavor for the Rochester campus, including the rationale for enrollment growth at UMR and initiative to generate increased enrollment. Chancellor Carroll and Assistant Vice President Carlson's presentation is a result of intensive strategic planning involving industry partners, UMR alumni, faculty, staff, and students, system colleagues with relevant expertise, potential and current academic program partners, higher education innovators, and community leaders. We couldn't think of anybody else. That. <laughs> UMR's presentation uh, today connects to a series of ongoing discussions about strategic enrollment across the system. In December of 18, I remind you, you heard an enrollment management presentation from University of Minnesota Duluth leaders. Earlier last year, you reviewed and discussed enrollment plans with leaders from the University of Minnesota's Morris and Crookston campuses. And later this afternoon, Acting Provost McMaster will provide an update on the Twin Cities campus's five-year enrollment plan, which we've done every year since you approved that plan in January of 16. So after today, you will have heard presentations from every campus individually about their enrollment planning. We've been providing campus-specific enrollment plans at the request of the board. At the same time, we are mindful of the interconnectivity of our great university and are moving forward with system-wide strategic enrollment planning. You heard from the System Enrollment Council in June of 18, and we're scheduled to provide another update to you in June of 19. We are stronger together, and we appreciate the board's direction to move forward with this essential system-wide strategic priority. So returning to UMR, I'll turn over the microphones now to Dr. Lori Carroll, Chancellor of the University of Minnesota Rochester, and Link Carlson, Assistant Vice President for Institutional Analysis in the University's Office of Finance. Thank you. Thank you, President Kaler. Chancellor Carroll and Assistant Vice President Carlson, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Omari and President Kaler. Regents, we're so pleased to be presenting these plans today. Uh, we're glad to have the opportunity. These are exciting times for Rochester and for the university system as a whole. And while we work together on a system enrollment plan, each of the five campuses is also busy recruiting the upcoming class based on our distinctive identities. At UMR, we are in the middle of a five-year enrollment plan. That established plan is included in your docket materials. As you know, we're on target to continue the projected growth of at least an additional 50 undergraduate students per year through recruitment and retention. But when it comes to enrollment planning at the Rochester campus, there are bigger questions to be addressed. What happens after 2020? How large will we grow? And how will we sustain our outcomes and innovation as we grow? To answer these questions, we've been engaging in extensive strategic planning, as the president mentioned, and a comprehensive analysis over the last several months. I have sought wisdom through dialogue with system experts and partners, industry community leaders, academic collaborators, faculty, staff, students, and alumni. And together, we've been asking, how can this innovative campus of the University of Minnesota best serve student learning, the university, 
public higher education as an enterprise in need of fresh models? And most importantly, how can this campus best serve the great state of Minnesota? One of the hallmarks of our state is that we are a community of problem <coughs> solvers. We think deeply about what needs to be done. We define feasible solutions, and then we commit to collective action in pursuit of a better future. UMR has drawn on that tradition to guide its strategic agenda for the next decade and beyond. At my inauguration in September, I asked that we look out from the top of the highest bluff in southeastern Minnesota to be inspired by the beautiful view in the distance and then climb back down and do the hard work of designing the next stage of the journey to move us in the direction of that inspiring view. What we seek are actions that will meet Minnesotans' needs while simultaneously drawing on the unique attributes of our trailblazing campus. One of those Minnesota challenges is the need to accelerate the development of the state's healthcare workforce. No less important is the challenge of satisfying the educational aspirations of all Minnesotans, including those that now, as in the past, have been underrepresented on our college campuses. We would be amiss not to point out that UMR understands well these challenges. We are a campus focused on healthcare. We have proved remarkably adept at recruiting and graduating a diverse student body. And we serve as a principal center of educational innovation for the university as a whole. What we lack as a brand new startup is scale. And that is precisely the challenge our next strategic enrollment plan addresses. Let us first acknowledge that Minnesota's healthcare workforce demands are accelerating exponentially. While this demand is widely known, one clear projection illustrates the growing need for educated healthcare professionals over the next six or seven years. The Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development identifies 28 healthcare occupations that require at least an undergraduate degree that are projected to grow by at least 10%. Many are growing even faster than that, and you can see the details in your docket materials. This growth means over 92,000 job openings in Minnesota for new positions that not only require an undergrad degree, but also pay enough for a family to live with stability in Minnesota. I'm grateful to Mark Schultz at DEED for these official State of Minnesota healthcare workforce projections. At the same time as healthcare workforce needs are accelerating, Minnesota's high school graduates are becoming increasingly diverse and are projected to decline in number, a national trend as well. These first two points are different sides of the same coin. It's going to take new ideas to meet the incredible healthcare workforce demand. One of the triumphs of our state is that in many arenas, we lead the nation in the quality of our education. However, as a state, sadly, we cannot make that claim for students from all backgrounds. UMR has proved to be a notable exception. The innovative Rochester campus is uniquely qualified to be a significant part of the solution. Now, I'm not suggesting that we can meet the demand for 92,000 new grads in the next year, uh, but we can contribute to the educated workforce and make another significant contribution. By launching a new campus that is driven to discover how to fuel student success, the University of Minnesota is not only distinct in the Big Ten, it has set in motion the discovery of solutions to systemic challenges like equity in achievement of education beyond high school, so vital to individual and collective thriving. As a result of our opportunity to focus on the quality of education, UMR can prepare a wider swath of the Minnesota student population, and importantly, we can discern and share the practices that are fueling increased inclusion and success. Not only are we innovative in education, UMR is also structured for long-term facilities efficiency and stewardship through public-private partnership. We are located in a growing Minnesota city that has invested in the long-term vision for this campus by supporting the purchase of property with city sales tax dollars 
so unusual, so wonderful. We're really grateful for our supportive, vibrant context, including support for this plan from the City of Rochester and the Destination Medical Center Economic Development Initiative. And we are seeking strategic connections with healthcare partners throughout the state, including the largest private employer in Minnesota, Mayo Clinic. The University of Minnesota and the healthcare industry can address the state's healthcare workforce demand in part by investing in bold enrollment growth on the Rochester campus. It is our aim that these will be students that are new to the U, not a siphoning of students from other campuses. As they do now, these additional students will come from all kinds of backgrounds, rural, urban, new American, first generation, and more. Currently, many capable Minnesotans start but do not make it through the undergraduate portion of their education, which creates difficulties for them and for all of us. One of the many consequences, critical healthcare careers that require graduate or professional education are not accessible to them. High demand careers such as addiction counselors and rural family practitioners. In many ways, the pipeline between higher education and the healthcare industry is clogged. We need to roll up our sleeves and go to work. At UMR, we've done just that, using evidence to guide practice. And now after 10 years, we know what to do and how to do it. Together, we can advance a series of key programmatic initiatives and collaborative partnerships that scale the Rochester campus, leverage existing system assets efficiently, contribute to the strength of the University of Minnesota, sustain success for more students, and unclog that pipe. What I know down deep is that we can do this and sustain the intimacy and innovation that got us started. How will we accomplish this enrollment growth? Well, first, we will expand undergraduate career pathways in these six key high demand areas, identified through an analysis of UMR alumni and affirmed by industry partners. Our efficient curriculum with a customized senior year makes this type of expansion feasible without adding multiple majors or minors. I know this approach to growth is different. Regents, I want to be sure you know it's different on purpose. The Rochester campus is designed to drive creative solutions. So rather than replicating the traditional practice of adding more and more majors and minors, we seek to be a future-focused campus, continuously adapting an efficient curriculum to produce graduates with core competencies linked directly to the rapidly changing needs of the workforce and culture. Then, through partnerships, we will create a University of Minnesota clear path for advanced study in high demand healthcare careers, leveraging existing university programs as well as smart new partnerships. In Rochester, the market for post-baccalaureate healthcare students is strong. One of the reasons senior leaders at Mayo affirm this plan. The established Rochester located nursing and bioinformatics programs are examples of this type of academic cooperation. Movement towards such endeavors is already in progress as we seek to create clear paths to meet Minnesota's need for public health administrators, physician assistants, integrative nurse practitioners, health coaches, mental health counselors, health analytics specialists, and more. And I'm very grateful to our current collaborators as well as emerging partners that will enable us to leverage the assets we have, including those under the purview of Dr. Toller, so grateful for his support, Dean Delaney, a long-standing partnership with the College of Nursing, Dr. Kreitzer at the Early Bakken Center for Spirituality and Healing, Dean Finnegan, and Chancellors Black, Bear, and Holtzclaus. <coughs> Third, with industry partners, we will launch a fresh funding option for undergraduate education, Invest in Success. 
With this model, the healthcare industry invests in the development of human potential, providing a direct connection between supply and demand. Invest in success industry partners from across the state will have the opportunity to fund students' undergraduate education in exchange for employment with conditions specific to the partner's needs and the student's potential. I'm grateful to the Office of General Counsel for their continued support as we work to develop and implement this pilot. And finally, we will expand our influence on quality and innovation in higher ed, connecting researchers from across all five campuses, publishing results, convening thought leaders, and creating professional development experiences for higher ed innovators. Such leadership has already begun with 30 institutions from across the country participating in the first Higher Ed Innovation Summit at UMR this past June. Higher education needs innovation leaders. And if through the work of the Rochester campus, the University of Minnesota can identify the educational practices that close the achievement gap for undergraduates while simultaneously creating clear paths to address high demand workforce needs, it is realistic to expect that we in Minnesota can lead the country as innovation influence leaders in higher education. As we look beyond the current enrollment plan, we know that scaling UMR is possible. Growth at UMR will require investment, seed money, and that investment will be good for the university, the healthcare industry, and Minnesota. We are asking to begin the journey into UMR's second decade with bold enrollment growth, aiming first for 1,000 students and then moving toward an even bolder 1,500. In the boldest, longer range view, if we squint and look far out, we predict that Rochester can eventually sustain a campus of 2,500 students. At any rate, it's time to get started. Minnesota needs us to do more. After all the analysis and all the input, I want to be crystal clear about what I see that we need to get started on the next decade of growth. First, to bring in larger first-year classes, we need to jumpstart the funding of four-year scholarships. One special challenge of a startup campus is that with six classes graduated, most alumni are still in graduate or professional school and haven't reached the age of 30. <laughs> we also need to expand recruitment strategically and select new high schools. And we need to hire essential additional personnel. We're very lean in Rochester, so virtually everyone at Rochester is essential. But by essential, I mean I am promising you we will not use new dollars to become top heavy. These are individuals who will work directly with recruiting and with educating students. And the time has come. If we are going to scale the number of students at UMR, we will need additional space. And whatever space we occupy, we intend to continue our P3 commitment, pursuing partnerships that work in concert with the growth in our vibrant city. Link will provide some more details. <laughs> um, uh, within your docket material, there is some detail around uh, uh, both the three scenarios that uh, Chancellor Carroll has talked about, the bold, bold, or boldest plan, as well as a year-by-year -year, uh, look at that bold plan. Um, just for some highlights, the plan does contemplate um, and funds a modest set of four-year scholarships, uh, recruitment scholarships for UMR. UMR currently has zero four-year scholarships to offer. Uh, and uh, the old, as uh, Lori mentioned, the oldest alumni is likely to uh, right around 30 years old. Uh, so jump, some jump starting of that while we work on uh, uh, more creative uh, foundation and development opportunities, private co corporations, foundations, partnerships uh, will need to uh, be established. Uh, UMR uh, recently hired their first development officer going through training uh, next month. Uh, but to give you a sense, if we were gonna try to endow just 30 four-year scholarships, of $4,000, which is going to be kind of a mid-range scholarship now, that requires a $10 million endowment. So we're gonna to have to be creative and do some annual giving things and some uh, private partnership 
ideas. Uh, the plan does uh, allow for two additional recruiters, uh, going all the way up to six, I think, uh, and additional uh, recruitment materials and technologies. Uh, the UMR educational model does not lend itself to just filling a recruitment funnel. They really have to be much more surgical and strategic. They have to find the five uh, high school students in every high school that actually are really passionate about healthcare education. Uh, beyond the recruiters, uh, this, this plan does allow for uh, very modest uh, academic hiring. Uh, we're talking about uh, student growth in the 40% range. Uh, we are not growing the staff by 40%, I can guarantee you that. Um, and all of the hires are contemplated to be student-facing hires. Uh, another thing that Rochester has done very well since its history is always leverage the system resources where possible. Uh, none of the anticipated hires will be of, of an administrative nature in Rochester. Um, finally, uh, you, you do have some uh, pages in your docket, uh, pages 14 through 17, dealing with uh, uh, the faculty space and additional uh, residence hall space. Uh, the Payne building referenced in your document is space UMR is currently leasing primarily for faculty space and some collaborative space. The UMR lease for that space expires in 2021. Uh, the owner of that building intends to take it down for uh, higher and better use. Uh, so we will have to find uh, space, uh, replacement space for the faculty uh, within the near term. Uh, the bold plan uh, would also fully fill the current residence hall at 318 Commons, uh, providing only a very m modest number of beds for sophomores and beyond. However, we are currently not meeting the chancellor's vision or research-based ba best practices by not providing uh, significant opportunities for second-year students to live in university-controlled housing, um, often with continuations of, in living and learning communities. Uh, we're also finding that in an accelerating downtown market in Rochester, it'll be difficult for our students and families to find affordable housing uh, near our academic centers without some uh, intervention from the university. And obviously there uh, are potential advantages for considering both of these facility requirements simultaneously, especially as we assume the continuation of public-private partnership strategies to solve as many of these space needs as possible. Um, finally, in terms of creating efficiencies, uh, the plan does require UMR to continue to maximize the use of current existing academic space, and the bold plan does not anticipate needing additional classroom or lab space at this time. Uh, an important part of the, of the expansion is uh, an expansion of the professional and graduate uh, partnership programs, we've been calling them PGP programs. Again, in the spirit of leveraging the system resources, the PGP programs are not new or duplicative full-time programs, but rather contemplates leveraging existing post-baccalaureate uh, degree and certificate programs from elsewhere in the system, repackage them in innovative evening, weekend, and executive pro program tracks, and that allows the campus to maximize the use of their current uh, existing academic footprint while minimizing the need for additional headcount personnel. Uh, finally, this plan does require the investment of some one-time resources to jumpstart both the recruitment strategy and to pre-hire, usually by one year, uh, any of the needed academic personnel before student growth occurs. It also requires uh, investments to keep up with inflationary or core costs like we talked about th this morning. Uh, however, the bold plan does not require uh, investment of extraordinary additional recurring state resources. Growth will be funded primarily through tuition revenue generated by additional students. Thank you, Link. So your innovative Rochester campus is producing phenomenal graduates, and I know that our students and our graduates make you proud. They very much make me proud. And I've pictured our two of these young people, Mason Schlieff, a UMR junior from rural Minnesota, and future nurse practitioner committed to the mental health needs of underserved populations. Um, Mason is also a student representative to the board. <laughs> also pictured is Mohammed Adani, a Minnesotan, a new American and a recent UMR grad working as a researcher at Mayo and produce, pursuing an MD-PhD as he 
continues to serve the local Somali com community. I am convinced that the human potential of young people from all kinds of backgrounds, coupled with Minnesota's healthcare workforce demand, makes UMR enrollment growth a responsible investment. You have my word that we will be superb stewards of that investment. As we look out from the top of the highest bluff in our region, the view is breathtaking. In the distance, we see a thriving campus characterized by the distinctiveness and quality we have established in our first decade. Rich conversation has led us to this presentation, and I'm excited to hear your questions and even more enthused for all of us to take this collective journey of growth. Thank you both. Uh, I'll first turn and ask if uh, our famous person who's sitting at the <laughs> dais has any comments. Student Representative Schlieff. Uh, thank you, Regent Omari. Um, this is just a really um, Im impactful just opportunity to be able to sit on this board um, for this moment because UMR has made incredible impacts on my life and my perspectives. Uh, for example, um, I do come from an underrepresented background on our campus, so I am from rural Minnesota, um, as Regent Anderson uh, is aware, by the Alexandria. Um, and then also I've had the opportunity of being a part of one of the living learning communities on campus which is very near and dear to my heart. Um, they have really changed my life. Um, and that has kind of inspired me um, in my uh, train of my career in wanting to pursue some place in an uh, underrepresented area. And I think that's something that's very special about our university, that a lot of our students have similar experiences like that. And it drives them to impact others like ourselves and continue uh, this growth in Minnesota. So thank you. Thank you. If this were an action item, I'm pretty sure it'd be a 12-0 vote. <laughs> Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Omari. Uh, Two questions, so I'll, one of them I think is pretty simple and the other one hopefully so with the chair's indulgence I'll ask the first one. So I'm looking at slide 31 and in the, that's the six bubbles there with the various areas that uh, you're looking for expansion and I'm always thinking as we talk about expanding and we did today with, with the College of Science and Engineering but aligning what comes from our expansion with the needs of the state and as I look at those six categories Here's my simple question. When we were there last March, it's always good to connect our experiential opportunities with what's happening in this room. Um, some of us wandered off with a male physician and we went and saw, I think it was sonography and respiratory mm -hmm. therapy. Where's that fit? Is that under the far left bubble of patient care? And is that where that is? Or are those going away? Are they not getting expanded? What? No, they're not going away. Chair Omari, uh, Regent McMillan. Uh, the, these expansions are occurring primarily in our Bachelor of Science in Health Sciences degree, and the programs to which you refer are from our highly successful partnership with the Mayo Clinic School of Health Sciences, ah, okay. uh, the Bachelor of Science in Health Professions. I do think that we would characterize those as patient care, uh, but it is a direct entry into the workforce following graduation with a four-year degree and the certification that the, the Mayo Clinic School of Health Sciences programs provide that's embedded within that degree. So the, this expansion is primarily with the capstones um, and, and yet those programs would be characterized as direct patient care. Most helpful, thank you. Can I follow Please, up? Regent McMillan. So, uh, and again, in that theme of matching our research and education here, largely education, but also outreach and um, capabilities, you mentioned at some point in your remarks, Chancellor Carroll, that uh, you had done some vetting of this with providers and uh, the people who are delivering, you know, health care to the people of Minnesota. And I would expect there to be lots of alignment and input from, from mail, mm -hmm. your, your neighbor, your partner, you know, a symbiotic relationship we're lucky to have with them. But what about the rest of the state and the big metro systems and, you know, how much give and take is there there? Are you thinking about, I'm sure you are, but can you give me some sense of uh, what is the rest of Minnesota, you know, how are we aligning with what they need and your role in providing it? Yes, Chair Chancellor Omari Chair. and Regent McMillan. Indeed, uh, the Mayo Clinic Health Systems does uh, serve many parts of the state in addition to having uh, such a large presence in Rochester. But 
we do have conversations with other uh, healthcare industry providers, uh, and those are in progress. On the next slide, where we talk about the clear paths and then the invest in success, uh, we are committed to uh, pursuing those partnerships with other enterprises and are engaging actively in the Medical Alley organization to be sure that we are connected with a variety of types of um, medical industry providers since our students will have such a, a wide array of opportunities when they graduate. So, yes. Thank you. Regent Powell. Uh, thank you, Chair Omari, and thanks, um, Chancellor Carroll. That was um, it's a very inspiring presentation. I think we're all grateful for kind of the human capital and human re that you're, you're building uh, at UMR, and it's nice to see a few bright faces in the presentation as well. It reminds us why we're here. Um, so having said all of that, I want to just jump a little bit to the numbers. Um, on I think it's page 14. There's a... There's a um, annual enrollment revenue investment requirements is the is the way to look at this that with the investments over the next several years um, we would sort of accumulate um, a, close, a million dollar sort of net uh, net loss um, in 2021 and then and then it improves dramatically going going forward as the enrollment so there's a little bit of a Losses that we're going to have to absorb here as we as we build into um, uh, a more highly scaled institution. Yes, Chair Omari and Regent Powell, uh, what we're anticipating in terms of budget implications is as a, a one-time commitment, and you're you're looking at the numbers that uh, reveal the the nature of that commitment, uh, but not a recurring or ongoing cost once we reach our enrollment target. Link, do you have? Mm -hmm. Uh, Chair Omari, Regent Paula, yeah, I would just say that, that what you're seeing there is the jump starting of scholarships um, and some pre hiring, maybe by only one year, uh, in anticipation of that, uh, of that student growth. The third thing I would say on there, it's on line 24 of the chart, you're looking at the pain replacement build out uh, number. Uh, one way that UMR has been successful in keeping their rental, their ongoing rental rates down is by providing the one-time money to do the build-out uh, rather than have the developers do that. And I think that will be a useful strategy uh, going forward as well. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Regent Simonson. Thank you, Chair Omari. Um, <clears throat> I think I told you when I visited your campus that when I first heard about it uh, 10 years ago, startup, I thought, why do we need it? It's this close to Twin Cities, and why do we need that added expense? But <clears throat> that visit really turned my turned me around. I think it's a very unique program. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> I like the interaction between the faculty and students. It's very special. I mean, that was very obvious when I was there. I like the internship and the research with mail. Uh, I, I like all of that. And, and, and uh, the other thing I really found unique is the integration of the some of the undergraduate requirements say, in the liberal arts with your science program. That, that's really, really special. And, and so just a couple of, uh, um, of comments or questions. You mentioned that growth in, in enrollment. I like what, uh, what we're just looking at this chart on page 11 or whatever it is. Uh, growth in en enrollment is going to be uh, funded by uh, fac uh, faculty in space, funded by uh, growth in enrollment. Mm -hmm. I like that. I mean, I don't know why we don't look at that. Other universities have done it, and I don't know why we don't look at that. This really looks good to me. But <clears throat> I guess my main, my other question is, I agree wholeheartedly with you, the need for area health care. And it's going to be a growing thing. My generation is going to need a lot more help, and, and uh, so on and so forth. But um, Minnesota State's also looking at that, and the community college is very hard. Do you see that as competition, and how you going to, how are you going to, uh, address that. Please, Chancellor Carroll. Chair Omari and Regent Simonson, thank you for those encouraging words. I, I think that all of us in higher education are working for common purposes and that we, we bring to the experience something unique uh, in the University of Minnesota. A part of that is our, our focus on research and at UMR, we're 
a demonstration of applying research results to the process of education. And so if we look at the outcomes in terms of graduates uh, completing within four years at over 90%, we don't see those kinds of uh, results in, in the, the good education that occurs in the other system. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a different approach and different model, but I think our reliance on research, and uh, I'll show you a list of the high impact practices, which means they are data-driven, research-driven practices. I really wanted to get to this slide, <laughs> so I just sort of worked it into that answer. But <laughs> well done. I knew you could do it. On the left side of the slide, you see nationally with lots of research uh, practices that are endorsed by the American Association of Colleges and Universities as retention fueling success practices. Note that UMR was privileged to organize from the beginning with all of these practices in place for 100% of the students. And this is unusual, and we're so <coughs> grateful to have been able to do that. On the right, you see the list of additional practices, and Mason mentioned the living learning communities that are seeing statistically significantly positive results as well. These are being <coughs> tested by our faculty and enjoyed by our students as well. So that research base, I think, is a distinguishing characteristic, Regent Simonson. Thank you, Chancellor Carroll. And we have two more in a very short amount of time, but I'm going to go to Regent Shu first and then Regent Rocha. Thank you, Chair Omari. Thank you, Chancellor, and um, APP Coulson. Um, I, I noticed on the sheet that, uh, the page 14 number sheet, uh, that so this year, this fall, we started with uh, 519 in terms of um, total undergraduates and uh, 169 new high school students. So can you give me an idea? I know we're kind of still in the middle of the process, but can you give me an idea of what the you know, projection looks like or what the actuals are for the commitments to start next fall? For next fall, uh, we're ahead of where we were last time this year. So we... We are strategic and, and cautious in our growth in that our students coming straight from high school need a place to lay their heads mm -hmm. and our beds are full. And so we want to meet our enrollment target. We expect to do so um, and we have a challenge. Thank you. Quickly, please. Oh, yep. Thank you, Chair Omari. Um, so if, we, if we're out of beds, um, and we're not, I mean, I, obviously that's the limiting factor that, that I'm hearing, um, that the bottleneck is really having enough space for students to live. Um, how are we, how are we going to address that going forward? Um, I know we have to, you know, increase uh, the number of beds in like fixed numbers. I don't know what the numbers are, but um, we have to add a certain amount at a time. So how is that going to work with, um, with your plan? Mr. Carroll. Chair Omari, Regent Shu, uh, we've explored many options, and uh, with the assistance of Brian Burnett's team uh, in space planning and real estate, uh, we have looked seriously at the possibilities, and uh, those have included uh, the potential to take on long-term leases with properties that are going up currently. However, the exploration has revealed that the price point for students would not be acceptable. And so we continue our exploration, but expect indeed to need a, you know, a, a, a P3 approach to the development of housing in the very near future. Thank you. Regent Rocha? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple um, remarks real quickly. This is. It's a great news story, and, and, and when you think about the university's unique mission, you know, what Rochester is doing and the high level at which it's doing it, it really exemplify, I think, how we differentiate the flagship um, system in the state um, you know, that doesn't come without caution. You know, and, and again, I'm, I'm sort of forged by the experience of, of uh, evaluating campuses and making some major changes uh, you know, a couple decades ago. And, 
you know, and, and really recognizing that cost, of, you know, over time people still look at those objective facts. What, what is it per student on this campus versus this campus versus this campus? And so certainly anything we can do to assist in getting, getting uh, the, the campus to where it is, is closer to some of the peers I think would be very um, important. Uh, you know, not, not only um, for the system as a whole, but also even for the community of Rochester and, and everything mm -hmm. else. I, the other comment would be that, you know, the, the, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but I think it, it bears mentioning putting our recruiting resources into Rochester is so critical because when you're not known, you're not known. Mm -hmm. and, and I've got a feeling that if you get into some communities uh, in the urban communities, in rural communities, and you, you know, sort of explain what you offer to students who would never have even known that you existed. I think you're going to, you know, I think you already are uh, reaping great results. So when we talk about the kind of money that we spend in recruiting, I really think that um, uh, scouring the state for the top students that are going to stay here, they know the climate, they've got connections here, they're going to stay here and, and work, particularly in the rural communities. Um, I think this is a really great opportunity for us to do that, as, uh, as we heard earlier. Um, and then the final thing is, and this is again come a bit of a historical perspective, when we were making the changes in the first district where we had, we discontinued a vocational ag program at, at Wasika and engaged in the partnership in, in Rochester, it was, as I stated when we were in Rochester, it was about Mayo and it was about IBM. And, and, and obviously coming back after 20 years uh, hiatus, it, it were very heavily focused on Mayo. But I understand there's still there's still some good stuff going on in the technology mm -hmm. front in Rochester. Is that anything part? Of, are we able to to still capture that, which was part of kind of the original concept? Is that a way of us also continuing to serve that community while also gaining some economies and in in at the same time? Yes, Chair Omari and Regent Rocha. Indeed, there is a focus still in emerging technologies, and that is one of our pathways, emerging technologies in healthcare. We currently have the bioinformatics program that is Rochester located, and that is one of our creative partnerships that uh, is growing and that we expect to channel more students from the undergraduate program at UMR into that graduate professional program. Uh, that's one of the ways we're growing. But on my advisory and advocacy group, we do have uh, former um, leaders of IBM who are informing our conversation as we look at emerging technologies. We're, we're also you know, thinking about artificial intelligence and how we might create a, a capstone pathway uh, that supports students learning how to learn as those changes come upon us. And as to your other comments, I would just note that small as we are, uh, sustaining the kind of quality that we have is an exceptional outcome, but it should also be noted given the hard work of the founding chancellor and all of the faculty and staff and the support of the system finance office that our books are balanced. So for a relatively modest investment, uh, we can sustain the momentum that is the Rochester campus. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Carroll and Vice Pre Assistant Vice President Carlson.